Hi everybody, I'm Chef Ricardo from Wellness in the Schools. Thanks for joining me today on A Bite of Wellness. For this particular episode, I want to focus on one of my favorite vegetables. It's a spring superstar, asparagus. We have a couple of other items on the table here that are also seasonal picks from spring, and they really match the vibe of the seasonal feeling. Spring is a time of year that is best characterized by growth. I'll talk about my asparagus here, and this is my spring superstar. But I hope you notice that I've got my asparagus in water right here. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's important to handle asparagus for the best nutritional quality. We want to keep this hydrated because the asparagus, as we receive it in the supermarket, is actually still growing. If we don't see that this is being hydrated in the supermarkets, or if we don't handle it well ourselves and don't put it in a little bit of water, you're going to see that the asparagus is going to turn a little bit wrinkly. It's not going to be quite as appetizing. It's going to lose that wonderful crunch that asparagus has. You also want to make sure that the tops look really nice and fresh too. If your tops are looking a little bit on the softer side, that's actually going to be a sign that the asparagus you're looking at might have been on the supermarket shelves for a little longer than desirable. So we always want to make sure that those tops are firm, that they're not really coming off. This is especially important too if you want to use the top of this asparagus spear as a garnish. All right, so so we're ready to cook right now. I went ahead and washed up my hands. We always want to make sure our hands are clean before we start working with food. I also went ahead and turned our oven up to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to need that high temperature in order to roast our asparagus and make it nice and crispy to make our asparagus fries. So that'll be the first recipe that we'll start off with. And remember, you always want to take a look at your recipe to see what mise en place or preparation you can do to start off ahead of time. Turning on the oven is the first step. The next thing we're going to do is go ahead and prepare our asparagus. I'm going to take my asparagus and rinse it down. I've got the whole bunch here. And for our asparagus fries, I particularly wanted to pick asparagus that was on the thinner, more slender side. A chunkier or bigger asparagus would be a lot more fibrous, and that would lend itself well to some dishes, but not quite for the asparagus fry. What we're also going to do is make a dredging mix at the same time. So we'll want to make a little bit of a mix with panko, and we're going to have that adhere to our asparagus with a bit of honey. I'm going to take the stems of my asparagus and I'm just going to trim that off. Especially if your asparagus hasn't been properly hydrated, those stems are going to be really thick and fibrous. It's not going to be as pleasant, so you want to go ahead and trim that off. We're going to cut about three inch lengths, but I will say I like to cut from the top down. I want to be mindful of including the top of that spear into the length of any cuts that I'm making. I do want to say that this is one of my favorite vegetables. Just nutrition wise, it's very nutrient dense and very low in calories too. So you can bulk up on your asparagus, but at the same time, you're not really breaking the bank nutritionally. And just a half a cup of asparagus is gonna have about 57% of the vitamin K that your body's gonna need. Vitamin K is important for healthy bones and a healthy heart as well. So little superstar, and that crunch comes from that fiber. Our asparagus is gonna be a great source of insoluble fiber, which is gonna be great for helping promote intestinal regularity. Fiber in general also feeds the microbiome as well too. And that little colony of bacteria that lives in our small intestines, our large intestines, naturally I should say are helping to benefit our body and they really love to eat the fiber from our uh, the fruits vegetables and other produce so in order to form our dredging mixture I'm just gonna put the dry elements together in a bowl right here and I'm gonna go ahead and use breadcrumbs now different breadcrumbs have different textures and I'm looking for a breadcrumb that's got a thicker texture I want to get a coarse feeling to simulate the crispiness that you would get from frying a potato to make a french fry and for that I'm gonna go ahead and use a panko breadcrumb now panko breadcrumbs is a Japanese style of breadcrumb and it's gonna be a coarser breadcrumb so it's something to say where you could definitely use a regular breadcrumb if that's what you have on hand this larger, uh, coarser variety is just going to really lend itself well to the texture. You could also substitute out regular breadcrumbs for whole wheat breadcrumbs. It's going to add a source of whole wheat and it's going to be a little bit on the thicker side as well too. So that'll definitely add some flavor and nutrition to your breadcrumbs as well, I mean, to your dredging mix as well. So I'll measure out a, a cup and a quarter here whenever you're measuring with a uh, measuring tool, be it a spoon, be it a solid measuring cup or liquid measuring cup, you want to make sure that you're filling up right to the very, very top. You don't want to have a heaping pile on there. You don't want to underfill to make sure that you are producing a recipe just the way the original writer intended. 
the next thing I'm gonna add is just a little bit of granulated onion. Truth be told, our breadcrumb mixture is not gonna have any salt in it at all. And the reality is that there's already salt in the ingredients that we're using here. Our panko comes from breadcrumbs, and bread actually is a pretty significant source of sodium, so we don't really have to add extra to start off with. But I'm gonna go ahead and use just a touch of granulated onion. I find in small amounts, it does stimulate the flavor of salt a little bit, but you don't really wanna go overboard with it. In this case, for my cup and a quarter of panko breadcrumbs, I'm really only using about a quarter teaspoon of granulated onion. I could bump it up to a half, but I'm also gonna add in some black pepper as well. And that is gonna add another flavor note too. So I don't wanna go overboard with that uh, granulated onion. A little goes a long way there. And I'll pour this right over my waste bowl as opposed to my actual bowl for that exact same reason. And I'll flatten that out just to make sure I'm getting the right measurement with my tool here. I'll get another quarter teaspoon. And the other thing is we are gonna have to add Parmesan cheese to our recipe as well, which is another source of sodium too. So when the salt's naturally there, we don't really have to rely on adding extra salt for flavor. So the one last thing that I'll go ahead and add to the dredging mixture will be one cup of Parmesan cheese. And I'm using the shredded Parmesan cheese here. And the, there will be a difference in volume if you use shredded versus grated. The grated will compact a little bit further down, so you could get away with using about three quarters of a cup. Either way, the Parmesan cheese is gonna add a bit of protein, but it's also gonna help to just glue together our dredging mixture to our asparagus. So I'll put that with the dredging mixture. The last thing that I'll go ahead and chop up will be our garlic. And we wanna go ahead and take our garlic and chop it down to a mince. If you've got garlic with the skin on like this, you can snip off the edges. You can also pop your garlic like this, depending on it, how loose the garlic is from the skin. Or you can take the knife, just take the flat side and smash it down on the garlic to break it loose. We're gonna cut it to a mince, so we don't have to make it pretty, to be honest. Depending on how much of the uh, asparagus fries you intend to make, if you're making a large volume, sometimes it makes more sense not to necessarily do this by hand, but to go ahead and use a food processor to chop down your garlic. We've got our garlic. I'm going to go ahead and pour that down in here. And the next thing that I'm going to do is help to put our dredging together. But I also want to get the other thing that's going to glue our dredging together. That's going to be our honey. And it does like, make this dish a little bit on the sweeter side, but we're not really using a lot of honey. So a little bit will go a long way. And between that and the Parmesan cheese, everything's gonna glue together nicely. I'm gonna add about a third a cup of honey to the mixture, but what I want to do first is take a little bit of oil and just put that into my container here, into my measuring cup. The reason being, that honey is super, super sticky. And when you've got sticky honey going into a measuring container or a measuring tool, say like a spoon or a cup in this case, you're gonna find that the honey is gonna to stick to the sides and it's gonna be really hard to get a measure. But if you pre-grease this and you don't have to use olive oil, you can use a neutral oil, um, whatever you've got at home, quite frankly, uh, you're gonna find that it's gonna be a lot more slippery. It's not gonna adhere and it's gonna allow us to measure this very well. And just like all our other measurements, we wanna make sure that we have a level container filled. And to that very point, here's our honey. So now I'll go ahead and toss this with the rest of my dredging mixture, our Parmesan cheese, our panko breadcrumbs, and our seasoning. I'm gonna take a wooden spoon to just toss everything together. And slowly but surely, we're gonna adhere all of this mixture to our asparagus. And actually looking at this, I don't wanna damage the asparagus. So rather than go in with my spoon, I'm just gonna go ahead and do just a soft toss to gently incorporate all of those bread crumbs, all of that seasoning and cheese onto my asparagus. As you can see right here, here's our asparagus fries, just about ready. I think I'm gonna add just a little bit of honey, uh, not so much honey, I'm gonna add a little bit of oil to help this adhere a little bit more. I see that there are some clumps of breading forming, so I'm just gonna add a couple tablespoons of oil, a little bit's gonna go a long way. And once you've got your asparagus fries laid out on a sheet pan, you wanna essentially make sure that they're flattened out to a single layer. With the oven at 425 degrees Fahrenheit, we wanna make sure that we have everything in a single layer so that it's roasted evenly. That way, we aren't ending up with one piece overlapping the other and really affecting the overall cooking and texture of the final product. So as I go ahead and do that, I'm also lifting up a little bit of the breadcrumbs here so that they can be sitting on top. 
The awesome thing about this recipe is that it wasn't developed in a home kitchen or even a restaurant kitchen. This recipe was actually developed with a school kitchen in mind. In one of our school districts, we partner with an organization that helps to get local foods into the schools. And one particular spring, we had a lot of asparagus, and we wanted to introduce it into a kid-friendly way. So we decided to simulate a french fry here, add a load of seasoning to it without necessarily adding salt. And it's something that's not being fried. We're going to go ahead and roast it, but we're going to still simulate that texture with all the mixture on here. This is going to go into the oven, preheated to 425 degrees for about a good 15 to 20 minutes. What you really want to look for is to start to see a little bit of browning going on. You'll see the cheese melting. One last note about the asparagus as I go ahead and put that in. You can find asparagus in its fresh form, just like I showed you on camera, but the asparagus also comes in a bag as well. You'll sometimes find it pre-trimmed. Actually, that's an option for a lot of fruits and vegetables. You can find a lot of them pre-processed. If that vegetable was cut, you want to use it immediately. You don't want to have that hanging around because the clock is ticking on that food once it's already prepared. Moving on over to our pesto pasta, we need to make our pesto. And the pesto is going to basically stand in as the sauce for our pasta. But as I say that, it is important to go ahead and make our pasta first. So I'm gonna start by looking at my water. It's not quite at a boil, but it will be in about two minutes or so. I'll pivot back to the pesto though. Our pesto pasta is gonna be made with two different types of greens. I've got baby spinach on the one hand over here, and I'm not gonna use the whole bag of baby spinach, but it's gonna to help to bulk up my pesto. It's gonna be a green that you can blend on in with basil, especially if in the spring season, when all of these vegetables are growing, you may not see as much basil because of the time of year. You could certainly blend in spinach or any other green vegetable to make a pesto. And our basil here is a sweet or Italian basil. This is the variety that you see most commonly in uh, supermarkets, but there are certainly other varieties. Basil is going to be another vitamin K superstar. It's gonna have a significant source of vitamin K. There's some vitamin A and some other minerals in there as well too. So I'm gonna take my basil and just chop it. And you don't want to run your knife over the basil a lot because that's actually going to cause the basil to turn brown. Just like yourselves, when you cut into certain vegetables or herbs, they tend to bruise. So we don't want to abuse them too much. And honestly, we're going to blend this anyway. So I'm just doing a rough chop to just break it down for size. So I want to make it a little bit easier for our immersion blender to blend into. Though if you have a food processor at home, your machine has the muscle to break through this pesto fairly easily. So here are three bunches of basil. And I'm gonna go ahead and measure that out volume-wise just to see what that would look like. When I'm working with a loose item like this, I wanna make sure that I'm packing down the spoon, uh, packing down the measuring cup nice and tight, or measuring spoon depending on what you're using to make sure that I've got a nice even measure. You wanna make sure that's packed. Certainly when you're doing uh, any measurements involving herbs, you wanna make sure that the cup is packed. This also applies to leafy greens. And for our bakers out there, this would also apply to brown sugar because sometimes that can really suck up some moisture and that can affect the volume of the final product. So we're at two cups right now, and I think this is gonna be an even four, but let's see. Here's our third cup, and one more makes four. So in order to make this pesto pasta, we're gonna be using four cups of freshly chopped basil, and we'll match that up with two or three cups of spinach, and that's gonna be about half of my bag here. I could use all of the spinach, certainly if I wanted to bulk up my pesto and make more of it, I could use that, but I'm gonna save the spinach for the very end too because that could be a very nice garnish for my pesto pasta when it's finished. The spinach will just nicely wilt into a freshly cooked pasta, and that's something that will give me the opportunity to add just an extra splash of color and extra nutrition, extra vegetables, in a flavorful way. I'm just gonna add in my pasta. I'm using a bow tie today. You can certainly use any pasta you prefer. A tube pasta like a penne would be perfectly fine, but I don't use a lot of bow ties in my cooking, to be honest, so I wanted to go ahead and feature that. You could definitely use a whole wheat pasta too, but no matter what type of pasta, you wanna make sure that you're following the package instructions. And especially important is to make sure that you are also watching the time so that you can go ahead and pull it out a couple of minutes ahead of time to make sure that it is tender to the bite or al dente. And speaking of things that are, I need to keep an eye out with regards to timing for, ooh, that cooked very quickly. Our asparagus fries are just about done. I would certainly say so. Let me bring it around. I wish we had smell -o vision This smells about as delicious as it looks. And unfortunately, I can't taste it right now. We're gonna let it cool down, but you could see the signs of doneness. You could see our cheese has melted into the asparagus, and you could see the panko breading is there. Um, 
you could see, once we scoop this out, we can get an opportunity to just readjust some of the panko breading, but all that flavor is there. It's gonna be an awesome presentation of our asparagus. And also to that asparagus tends to be a little bit on the bitter side, but when it's roasted at a high temperature like it was there, it's actually gonna come out a little on the sweeter side. And funny note on asparagus too, asparagus has a compound in it called asparagine that's actually responsible for a lot of the odors of asparagus, that sort of grassy, sort of bitterish odor. It's also something that our body readily absorbs too. So sometimes when you're eating asparagus and you tend to smell it afterwards, that's not your mind playing tricks with you. That's actually the asparagus. The next thing that I'll do is measure out my olive oil and I'll work on cutting down my lemons to size. Our olive oil, we're gonna save for the very end. That we're gonna measure out, but we wanna make sure that we have that ready to pour in with our pesto as we blend it. And that's actually gonna to help to bring everything together. For our lemons, I'm just gonna go ahead and roll each lemon down to size. And what I'm actually doing is breaking down the juice sacks inside of the lemon. So that will help to loosen up the juice, make it a little bit easier to go ahead and juice that lemon. We need that nice shot of acidity to just counteract some of the savory flavors and the grassy notes that are gonna go into our pesto from the other ingredients. But that lemon also makes it a good source of vitamin C as well too, which is important to add into our diets whenever we're feeling under the weather. And we're gonna end up with about a third of a cup of juice from our two lemons. The proper way to go ahead and measure this is to look at it at eye level. And if I look at it there, I see we've got one third of a cup of juice. So I'll add that in with our garlic, our basil, and our, uh, our spinach. Usually pine nuts would be used and featured in the traditional pesto that originated from Genoa, Italy. However, you can have a nut free version of a pesto as well too, or you could substitute with another nut. The beauty about this is that there's a lot of flexibility in the recipe to go ahead and prepare it as you will. So I'm gonna add in one cup of cheese here, but I'm also gonna keep another cup on the side. If I think it needs more flavor wise, I can go ahead and add that in. But also too, I wanna keep some on hand to just add in as a garnish. And I'll do that at the very end when we have our final dish prepared. I'll also add just a little pinch of black pepper too. When I say a pinch, I mean a pinch. I'm gonna actually add in a pinch and take a, two fingers to measure that out. But sometimes depending on the recipe, you might see a pinch listed as 1 16th of a teaspoon. Sometimes you might see a dash listed as an eighth of a teaspoon. These are really, really small measurements, but sometimes the way a chef writes things will matter when translated over by another chef. So I'm gonna take my olive oil and I'll measure that out ahead of time. At this point, well, first things first, let me get that spout off. At this point, I wanna measure out a cup's worth of olive oil. And the way that I'm gonna add this in is gonna be to add it in a slow and steady stream while I'm blending my pesto together. All of these ingredients are going to blend down very, very quickly. However, I wanna make sure that I am not holding the blender in such a way that the blades are gonna be exposed to air. That's gonna create a mess actually. So I wanna keep the head of this blender submerged or immersed in my liquid. And right now, this isn't quite a liquid, but what I'm gonna do is hold the trigger right over here. And as I start to add in my olive oil, I'm gonna create enough liquid to just press down, to start blending, to break everything down to size bit by bit. Actually, I'm gonna hold on to that thought for one moment because our pasta should be ready. And so at this point, I'll also take my pasta and I'm just gonna hit it with a little bit of cold water. The reason being, it's still cooking right now and I just wanna stop that cooking process. And so our basil pesto is finished blending up. This blended on down to about two, two and a half cups and we're gonna add that into our one pound of pasta. So here's our finished basil pesto right here. And remember that there are a variety of ways to go ahead and make pesto. So if you don't necessarily have the greens of that I use today, you could certainly blend in a parsley or another herb like a cilantro and really make it your yuck. But I'm gonna take our basil pesto now on the side and we're gonna add in all of our components together. We're basically gonna build our pasta dish and heat it through once again. So I'm gonna take my pasta right here and add it back into the bowl. We've got our penne, uh, we've got our bow tie pasta and I'll add that back in. This is about a pound's worth and that's gonna make about six to eight cups, I would say closer to eight cups worth of pasta. So really that, if you size it down, makes enough for eight really, really bulky servings, or you could take that and break it down to about 12 smaller size servings. The serving size definitely matters with something like pasta, especially the white pasta that we've used here. But even if you're using a whole grain pasta, you wanna be mindful of how much grain you're having. And it's always important to be mindful of your serving sizes, especially with a delicious dish such as the one that we're gonna make. So to go ahead and make that, 
I'm going to take this dish and fortify it with some other vegetables that'll make a complete meal. I've got white beans here and I'm going to go ahead and add in my uh, great northern beans here. You could certainly use a cannellini, you could use a smaller bean, say like a navy bean. You're adding in a source of protein to our be dish here. It's a plant forward protein. You could certainly substitute any other plant uh, or non-plant protein that you prefer in this place. I like the color of the beans. It works well with the flavor as well too. So that will be really, really delicious. The next thing that I'm gonna add in is going to be our peas. This is also the star of our show with regards to seasonality. And peas are something that come into uh, season a little more along late April, early May. It's certainly a mid-spring vegetable. And actually, we treat it as a vegetable, but it is actually a legume. It's a little more botanically similar to the uh, white beans that I just added on in, as opposed to say an actual vegetable, but we treat it as such. The awesome thing about peas is that they're going to have four grams of protein per half cup of serving, and it's a really, really good source of protein. So it's something where we can have our peas, maybe mix them with another plant source of protein in order to get a complete protein to satisfy our needs for that dish or throughout the course of the day. Remember, you don't have to pair the complementary proteins at every single meal perfectly. We don't have to go that crazy with our nutritional planning, but I'll certainly just fold this in a little bit. And as I'm doing that, our pesto is gonna be mixed into our pasta. And I'm just gonna lift that up slowly. I don't wanna stir the pasta too much, especially say if you opted to use a noodle type pasta, it's something where too much mixing will cause it to get really, really thick. It's gonna actually cause the product to get, uh, build up its gluten. And when that happens, that makes for a gummier. Last but not least, I'm just gonna go ahead and top this off with some garnishes once I get this onto a plate. So our plates are finally plated. Everything looks absolutely beautiful. And this is just a perfect sign of spring. You have those beautiful green hues against a couple other uh, different colors, and we're gonna go ahead and garnish off our pasta in just a second. But before that, I wanted to talk about the star of the show here, our peas. And here you could see peas in their fresh form. So let me just come on over and shuck this for you. What I really like about the peas is that in addition to being a good source of protein, Peas are associated with a decreased uh, risk of cancers, certain cancers. It's also associated with a lower risk of high blood pressure on account of all the micronutrients inside of it. And it is associated with a, a lower risk of type two diabetes. The reason being why is that these peas have what's called a complex carbohydrate inside them. Long story short, when we eat peas, their impact on our blood sugar is so minimal that it's not gonna cause a spike in blood glucose, and that's not gonna cause a spike in insulin. So this is a friendly option for a diabetic to have that's really nutrient rich, it's really delicious. I'm showing you how I'm just shucking some of the pea shells here. If you don't feel like doing this work hands-on, you can absolutely take peas and buy them in a frozen form as well. And late April to early May, that is the peak of pea season. So make sure to get in on that. They're really, really delicious, low in calories, high in nutrients. Definitely a good start of the show along with our asparagus here. But for the rest of that dish, I'm gonna go ahead and garnish that. I'm gonna go ahead and just hit this with a little bit of tomatoes. We've got our contrast and color for garnish here. You could definitely use a cherry tomato, but I took my beefsteak tomato, cut it up into little dice, and this is just adding a nice little color, nice little flavor, and a texture contrast too with the raw versus the cooked veg. The next thing that I'm gonna do is add some asparagus spears. And I'm gonna take a few of them here, but the length of this asparagus, which is about two inches or so, is a perfect complement to the other textures going on in this dish. And I'll just put it right along the top. I am preferentially choosing the spears, uh, the tips of the spears, to be perfectly honest. That's something where I wanna showcase that this is asparagus and there's no other better way than doing this by choosing the freshest spears you possibly can to just put on top as a garnish. Now, as a third garnish, I can go ahead and add in some Parmesan cheese and that's gonna add a nice little color contrast. We've got the green, the red, the white all going on. I can certainly use my shredded if I do have that, but I wanted to show you another form of Parmesan cheese here. Here you have Parmesan cheese as part of a block. So if you can imagine this, this chunk was actually part of what was once probably a 55 uh, pound wheel of cheese, and that had to be broken on down. And you'll see these sold for little chunks, you're getting a little bit at a time. This is gonna keep the cheese fresher getting it in this form because I'm gonna go ahead and freshly grate it with this grater. You could use a box grater or a microplane zester if you desire as well too. Ooh, that was a little broken up there. But I'll go ahead, I'll grate this freshly, and it's gonna have so much more awesome flavor than our pre-shredded cheese, but at the same time too, there'll be a little bit of a volume difference. So you generally can't uh, translate one-to-one -one between a grated cheese and a shredded cheese. There will be a little bit of difference in the measurements. Here's our grated cheese. 
nice, awesome, have to control myself to not just eat it right there. And I'm just gonna sprinkle it and I'm gonna just season from a great height. And the reason I'm doing that is I don't wanna go down to one spot and get a whole load of cheese in one area and not spread that cheesy goodness everywhere. So about a foot, foot and a half up, I'm just coming on down, hitting this. Um, and this dish is practically ready. So the last thing that I have to do is the one thing that a chef does all the time to make sure that the food is good and that's gonna be to taste it. So if I'm treating this like our main meal, I'm gonna take a little bit of our appetizer first. I'm gonna come over on this side and just grab a little piece of our asparagus fries. So it came out really nicely. The breading is nice and adhered onto the fry as well. And last thing to do is just go ahead and take a taste of it. Mmm, that's yummy. Tempted to not just want to pick that up and eat it, but there it is. There's my mind treating it like a French fry. So the flavor is really good on that. The asparagus is tender, but you can just feel a little bit of bite when you bite into it. It was roasted just perfectly. That was just in that 425 degree oven for about 10 minutes or so. Mmm. It has a lot of umami flavor coming from that Parmesan cheese, but I'm also getting a little bit of that savory flavor from that onion, from the garlic that went in there, but admittedly a little bit of a sweet aftertaste. And that's to be expected. We did use a little bit of honey to help adhere the dredging mixture together, but that's what's going on with our asparagus. Really nice flavor, awesome. Now to move on over to our pasta, I'm gonna go ahead and just take a little tongue full of it. Get a little bit of all the components here. It looks really good, it looks nice and fresh. That basil is gonna be awesome for flavor. And in terms of its health benefits, it's also gonna be really awesome. Basil is associated with a decrease in memory loss, um, a decrease in blood pressure, and an increase in a mental alertness. So let me go ahead and taste this pasta. And I'll get a little bit of everything on it. It's a nice mix of colors, there we go. This really does look like a little bit of string on a fork. What I really like about using certain types of pasta is, depending on how they're shaped, they'll hold onto the sauce really well. And in this case, with the chunky pesto, it's gonna hold into the folds of that bow tie, and it actually carries the flavor really nicely. Um, the beans were a little bit on the lighter side in flavor to me, but if I had let this sit for a little bit, the beans would have had an opportunity to soak up a little bit of that pesto. This would make for a really, really awesome picnic dish the great thing about it is that if you choose not to season it with the Parmesan cheese, this could be held cold and it'll transfer really, really well. Perfect for a spring or summer celebration. I hope that you enjoyed all of these different recipes. You may feel inspired by the preparation. Um, certainly, if you do feel like replicating these recipes, keep an eye out after the credits roll. You'll see the recipes as always. And thanks for tuning in to A Bite of Wellness. Enjoy the bounty of vegetables as they are presented in season. It's really the best tasting vegetable you could possibly have at the lowest cost, and it's the most nutritious too. Can't beat that, certainly. Thanks for tuning in to A Bite of Wellness. See you next time.